Hello, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Cindy Bird. I'm curator and folklorist at, here at the Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art. And a, most people, I think, know what a curator does, but a lot of people say folklore. What, what, what is that? What is folklore anyway? So um, folklore, for our purposes, uh, encompasses uh, traditional arts on, uh, on Delmarva. And traditional arts are things that are handed down orally or by, show, by demonstration from one generation to the next. So one person, uh, you know, quilting is a good example. Um, other kinds of um, art forms are a good example. Beekeeping is a good example. Uh, you usually learn to keep bees from another person, whether it's uh, your father or your friend. So these things that are handed on orally from person to person are what we call folklore. So um, with our Lower Shore Traditions program, we have um, a series called No Idle Hands, um, discovering the domestic arts of a Maryland's Eastern Shore. And it's funded by the um, Maryland Traditions and also the Lower Eastern Shore Heritage Council. And so today, this is the first of our presentations that kicking, that's kicking off our series. And this is Deb Gerger. Deb Gerger, you can see on her top, she's got Bee Whisperer. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> so she's our Bee Whisperer. She's our beekeeping expert. And uh, we want to thank her for coming and uh, giving us all the opportunity to, um, to learn about this art form. And she will start by uh, showing off the equipment and, and what it's used for. And we have some great historical facts on, on beekeeping that we'll be inserting here and there, here and there as well. Uh, Deb, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can uh, get, get started. OK. I want to thank you for having me here. This is, uh, this is something I enjoy doing. I enjoy speaking about something in my life that was quite an unexpected joy. Um, my husband kept bees for years. When we were first married, he showed me his hives. I thought they were very nice, no interest, but they were nice. And when we had our daughter, things got a little more hectic, and he sold his hives, got out of beekeeping, and, um, and life went on. After our daughter got a little older and entered 4-H, I thought it would be a pretty like, good idea for him to get some bees again and show her, um, show her what beekeeping was all about. It was something that most kids didn't know about. It was something that she could do in 4-H. And, uh, and he did. He purchased a couple hives and showed her all about beekeeping. And no pun intended, but I was bit by the bug. I'm the one that now is the beekeeper in the family. Um, I thoroughly was fascinated by what he showed my daughter. Um, she's now gone off to college and no longer is involved in beekeeping, but she has a knowledge. She has a base. She, she has an understanding. I continue to keep bees, and I currently have 10 hives at our home. Um, one of the interesting things that I found out many, many years later, um, that it, it truly is a, a heritage craft, because I was speaking to my mom many years ago, several years ago, and um, th dad was complaining because the neighbors, they lived in a neighborhood and, and they had purchased some hives. And he came in and he was grumbling because he was not going to mow around the hives. He just was not going near the bees. And mom was sitting in her chair and she said, I don't know why that's a problem. Ma had bees. Ma was her grandmother, my great grandmother. Ma had bees and we played around them. There was never a problem. And I said, I'm sorry, would you say that again? Because as much as we talked about Ma, and my great-grandmother, she had never mentioned that part of it to me. And she said, Ma had bees. Really? Well, the interesting thing is, my name is Deborah Annette Gerger. My grandmother's name was Emma Annette. So I was named after Ma. And I thought it was interesting that to find out years later that she was a beekeeper. They were indeed her hives. And now that this was something that I was getting into, um, so the tradition continues on. It's a it's a family, I'm proud to say it's a family, a family business now. Um, the third, first thing I want to tell you about bees would be where they live. Currently, this is what we use to house our bees. It was developed by Langstroth actually 200 years ago this past spring. Um, what he developed was a system that we could go in and take off honey without destroying the hive. Previously, they were kept in skep hives and other logs, that type of thing. And when it was time to get the honey off, you had to completely destroy the hive. And this hive is and what all. a skep hive 
when people say a skep hive, this is what it looks. Mm -hmm. It's obviously not a candle, but it's the it's the straw uh, dome shaped hives that you see in fairy tale books and things like that. That's a skep hive, and and it was hollowed out in the in the bottom. And when it came time to get the honey, you had to com destroy the complete hive, bees and all. Um, he wanted to develop something that was a little easier to manage, a little easier on the, the bees. So he came up with this box system. It starts off with, of course, your bottom board. This is the ramp for them to enter. Next, some of the newer hives have what we call a screened bottom board. The reason for the screen is for ventilation. And also, if they have any mites or any parasitic problems, when these, these parasites drop down, they drop through the, the screen down to the ground. We don't have to worry about them anymore. So it, it helps with pest management with the bees. That goes right on the top. Closest to the bottom, we have what we call a brood chamber. Each of these boxes is called a super. Okay? This is a very large super. As a matter of fact, this is the frame that, it, that comes out of it. It's very large. And the reason it's large is this is where, this is the nursery for the bees. This is where they keep their babies. This is where the queen basically stays. And in each, in each super is a frame that looks like this. Of course, they're not blank. We put something in it called foundation. The reason we put foundation on it is to give the bees something to, to work on. They have no problem, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. They have no problem when they're in a tree and swarming, building their own comb. And I'll leave this up here later so you can get a closer look. Each layer of wax is perfectly side by side. This is what gave him the idea to have the boxes like this, because as you can see, each box has 10 frames side by side based on what they naturally build. However, if you put bees in this without any foundation for them to build on, they will connect all the dots. They will, they will connect everything together. One of the um, things I came across in my reading um, was that uh, one of the things that Langstroth did was he determined that there was a, a, an ideal space to, to have between the um, two uh, frames so that it would leave it open for them to, um, they were far enough apart that the bees could form a passageway between them and get from one to the other, but, clo but not so close together that they would stick all the honey comb exactly. together. So he determined that exact um, number that mm -hmm. they needed to have room in the box to, um, to keep the frames apart. So I thought that was kind of neat. The exact number is 3 18ths of an inch. And if you can see, if we can hold these up, mm -hmm. these are two frames of honey that came. This is what you would see, very heavy. But if you look at it this way, there's a space. That space in between right there. <laughs> okay. And that's, that's the exact amount of space that they need to get in between each frame and do their job, but not glue it together. Okay. Okay, so we have our brood chamber. This is where the, the nursery is. This is where she lays her eggs and the young are, is, are raised. Um, they are bigger because we want lots of brood. Lots of brood. So we give them plenty of room, as compared to these, plenty of room to lay eggs. How many eggs will she lay? Billions in a lifetime. She'll live between one and three years. So in, those, in that amount of time, she'll, she will lay billions of eggs. Uh, she just, and that's what she does continuously. She does not take a break. She just continuously lays eggs. So for each hive, we like to make sure she has plenty of room. So we give her two, two supers. And of course, you can tell they're very, very deep. After we have this established for a new hive, and the hive is growing because she's laying plenty of eggs and has plenty of room, we start to add the honey supers. That's what we as beekeepers look for. These are a little bit smaller than the deeps. And part of the reason for that is just simply mechanics. When you feel the difference between this and after the demonstration, feel free to come up and, and play with that, and this. These are very heavy. Very heavy. they're covered up with. They're very heavy. Each super 
if it's a medium super, probably weighs between 50 and 60 pounds of honey to take off. So they're very heavy when we move them. And of course, if we're very fortunate, we just continue to add supers. Um, the next part of the hive is the inner cover. It has a hole, again, for ventilation and the heat. And there's a little notch right there. What we do is we take that notch and we put it like that. And in the summer, we take the top cover and prop it open to give them ventilation and it gives them an extra entrance and exit. Um, so the bees in the top don't have to continue to go all the way down and out. So that's our hive, thanks to Langstroth. Um, the bees that live in the hive. I brought this for one reason. We're not going to go over the entire thing of bee biology. But one of the things I've heard people say is, oh, you eat honey? That's bee vomit. <laughs> No, it's not. Because here is the bee's stomach. Here is the honey stomach. Totally different. The bee takes in the nectar. It goes to the honey stomach. And when it, it's mixed with enzymes, and then it's put back into the cells. Now, what it takes in for nourishment goes to a completely different stomach, and it's processed completely differently. So it, it is indeed a hygienic product. Um, and because of the enzymes, I'm sure you've, you've all heard, very nutritious. Um, let's talk about some of the tools that we use. The first and most important would be the bee suit. And I brought this one because it's my favorite. <laughs> I have a 4-H group. Um, when my daughter left 4-H, uh, we became interested in, in working with the kids. It's a wonderful program. So we started beekeeping. I have five, five families. 12 kids, ranging from 5 to 16. This is my 5-year-old suit. And we dress him up, and we glove him up. And it's amazing when they know they're not going to get stung how confident they are when they go out to the hive. Um, it is truly an amazing thing to watch these kids start their own smokers, go to the hive, pull out. Uh, Cindy's, Cindy's witnessed some of my kids. Um, and they're very excited because this is something that not a lot of kids know about when they go to school. And it gives them, you know, something to talk about. One of my favorite stories from 4-H is one of my young men who is very, very shy, painfully shy. He's my oldest. Went to uh, a neighbor's house. Mom said that he had started bees. He had his own bees. And he uh, needed to go get strawberries. She said she'd go get them. And he said, no, it's all right. I'll go get them. So he went to go get them, and an hour later came back from the neighbor's house because the neighbor also had bees. So he stayed and he talked about bees. Um, this was just, this was wonderful. You know, it was beekeeping that completely changed this kid because now he had something that he could talk to his neighbor about and uh, gain confidence from. So I was very pleased with that. Within the hive, what we have what we call the case system. And we have the workers. They live anywhere from three weeks in the summer, because they're very busy, to three months in the winter. They're less busy. Their job is to work. They have many jobs. One of the jobs is uh, the very first thing they do, parents, is when they come out of their cell, they turn right back around and they clean out their own cell. So you can use that you know, with your children, if you'd like. <laughs> Um, it moves on to being a nursery provider for the, uh, the young larva. Uh, we have an undertaker bee whose job is primarily to take out injured and, and dead bees. We have, um, they, they graduate from there and they move out of the hive and then they gather nectar. That's at the end of their life. Um, I think the progression is really very interesting when you look at it because um, they move out of the, the hive at the end of their life. Most of the bees that, that die, that reach the end of their life, do so at the end. And, and it's when they're out in the field. They just simply don't come back. Um, so the next 
would be the drones. Of the worker bees, there's probably anywhere between 10,000 and 60,000 in a hive. There's about a third of that of drones. The drone has one job, and that's to mate with the queen. That's his only job. The rest of the time, he, he roams around the hive. Um, and in the fall, when it's getting cold and the bees know that it's, it's getting cold, they're going to need their honey stores, um, the girls actually kick him out. So you can stand at the entrance of the hive and, uh, and watch the battle as they are encouraged to leave <laughs> um, because they need the honey for the, for the winter. Um, and of course there is one queen in the hive and her job is to lay eggs and lay eggs and lay eggs. Billions in her lifetime. She lives between one and three years. Um, When it comes to, to raising brood, which is very important for the vitality of the hive, here we have a picture of the queen laying the egg. And she's developing into a larva. The worker bee is coming in and feeding that larva, the nectar that's brought back. Now, if you want to take this and turn it into a queen, you feed it, you feed it royal jelly. That's the only difference between a queen and a worker. It's what you feed it. They all start out as larvae. The larva grows, and then the bees come around and they cap the cells. Once the cell is capped, there's no longer any feeding going on, but it's still developing, and eventually it comes out. Okay. Yes? How do they determine which, um, which one gets the Okay, the question was asked, how do they determine which egg to feed the royal jelly to? It has to be a fertilized egg. The unfertilized eggs become the drones. And basically, they won't do this unless for, except for two reasons. They're getting ready to swarm because they don't have enough room in the hive, or they sense that they're queenless. The queen emits a pheromone, and if they sense that they don't have a queen, they'll get busy and start rearing a new queen. Um, that's one of the reasons, uh, if you ask 50 beekeepers a question, you'll get 50 different answers. <laughs> um, my preference is, is to let the bees do what they do. Um, there are beekeepers that, that are interested in production, they want production. So if they know their, queen is, their hive is queenless, they'll introduce a queen. I would prefer to let them raise their own. For one thing, if it's a gentle hive, they're going to raise a gentle queen. And I would prefer that they do that. Um, so that's, that's how they know. Either they're queenless or they're getting ready to swarm, break off and swarm. Along the same line, the next season when they need a new drone, how do they attract one? I mean, they kick the old one out. They raise them. They raise them. Mm -hmm. okay. She'll start, she will actually hold off of raising drones mm -hmm. throughout most of the winter. But as spring approaches, she'll start kicking in and start raising drones, and she'll raise the, their own drones. And this is a picture. Again, uh, after the presentation, you're welcome to come and look through this. It's a, actually taken by my 4-H kids, um, and it's a picture of the emerging bee coming out of the cells. There are several ways we get bees. We have hives, so when they get too big, we make splits. We go in, we take frames of bees, and we put them in another, another hive. That's a nice thing, to, nice problem to have. It would be a hive that's too, too full. We do this because we don't want them to swarm. If we leave them crowded, they'll sense that they're crowded, there's no more room, and the queen will leave with a, a group of bees. We don't want them to do that. That's a loss to our hive. So we split them before they do that, give them plenty of room. The other is to get a package of bees. This is what a package of bees looks like. There's a, there's a mound of bees clinging to the top right here, and right in the center, there's a jar filled with, um, with sugar water, and also the queen is on that side, so they're covering her up, they're protecting her. Um, we were just talking earlier that, that the post office will typically call us when 
our package of bees is in, and, and usually they express that your bees are in, please come get them now. <laughs> They're in a cage, but they want you to come get them now. So. The other way we can get uh, bees, and uh, we just recently did this, is a fantastic thing. As I was saying, when a, a hive gets too crowded, they swarm. Um, sometimes other people have hives, and they swarm, and we go get them. Um, this is a, hot, a swarm hanging in a tree. Very easy to, to get. Can you just lower that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, good. Good? Okay. Basically, if they're low enough and they're on a branch, very easy to get. You, they're very docile. They know they don't have a home. They don't bother you. Uh, you just basically shake them into a hive and, and head out. If you have the queen, they will go in the hive. They will go in the hive. There's no problem with that. Um, excellent way to get bees. As a matter of fact, we have gotten swarms when we checked for the queen. Um, she's a marked queen, which, which means that someone actually spent about $85 to purchase a mark, marked queen, and she decided she wasn't happy where she was, so she left, and she took some bees with her. And uh, so, it, you know, it's always fascinating when we pull out the frames and we go, oh, my gosh, we have someone's expensive queen. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? They're marked with a, a very small dot. Before they, leave the, before they leave the factory, they put the... There, there is. There's a queen factory, yes. Before, that's all they do, queens and, queens and um, well, queens and packages. Um, they put a dot on her. They put her in a cage, take a little tiny thing that looks like a nail, uh, nail polish brush, and put a dot on her. <clears throat> and each, excuse me, each um, dot is a different color for each year. I believe this year it's green. So you know how old your queen is. If I go in two years from now and I see a, a queen with a green dot, she's two years old. And that's the purpose of the color of the dot. Remind us again how long a queen lives. One to th I'm, the question was asked how, how long a queen lives. She lives between one and three years. And again, some, peeper, some beekeeper, beekeepers prefer to go in and take care of their own queens. And, and if she's not producing anymore, they actually kill their queen and requeen. I prefer to let what's going to happen happen when she's done with her life. You know, they will raise a new queen. Um, and when you're looking inside the hive, you'll see a frame like this. These flat cells are worker bees. You're looking at, at a brood frame. You'll notice if you can, when you get a chance to look closer, some of them are raised. We call them bullets. Um, those are drones because they're a little bit dr larger. This is a queen cell. It looks like a peanut hanging down because she's much larger, needs more room. So we can, go, we can tell when we go in if we have a queen cell, if we have brood, worker brood, if we have drones. Um, the queen lays both fertilized and unfertilized eggs. She knows which to, li to leave in each cell based on the size. When she backs in, the theory is, is that she can sense the size of the cell and she knows that if it's smaller, she lays a fertilized egg. If it's larger, she lays an unfertilized egg, which will become a drone. Um, and again, this is a queen cell hanging down. As beekeepers, when we go in, we know that if we see this and the cell is hanging down, they're getting ready to swarm. This is a super, what, what, what we call a um, swarm cell. They hang it down below the frame. When we see the queen cell in the middle of the frame, we know it's super seizure. We know that she, they don't have a queen and they're raising a new one. So there are all kinds of signals that they do, you know, to tell us what's going on inside the hive. Um, some of our tools that we use, you've seen the veil. Basically, I go out with a jacket um, and a hood because I don't, you do not want to get stung in the face. I don't use gloves. Uh, for, for one thing, I want the stings. 
it truly is good for our arthritis. You'll hear that, um, but it, I, I can attest it is. I've had some arthritis in my fingers and the bees take care of it for me. So I don't mind getting stung. Also, you can imagine that when you have this on and you're trying to reach in, in between the bees and pick up something that looks like this and flip it up and examine it, your dexterity is really compromised by wearing gloves. I kill a lot of bees that way. And the quickest way to get stung is to go in the hive and start killing bees because they, they emit a pheromone that is an alarm signal and they, they, will, start, they will start to sting you. One Some, of the, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Some beekeepers um, even believe that the more often you get stung, the less mm -hmm. irritating it is. And in fact, when they do medical studies of beekeepers who've been stung many times, um, the more frequently and often they've been stung, obviously you don't want to be stung all over your body all at once, but, but the more stings they've had in working with bees, they find that in their blood they have um, more resistant, they're called antigens, that resist the bee venom. So your body actually responds to those stings by making it um, the chemicals of your body so that it's less irritating mm -hmm. for you over time. So experienced beekeepers uh, really do think that it's the, um, important for the safety of the beekeeper to actually have a sting or two here mm -hmm. or there because it um, helps their body build up a resistance to it. And I actually um, have a gal that's, that's a friend of mine and also a beekeeper, and she only wears the veil. She'll go out in short sleeves because she wants the stings. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's a matter of preference, I guess. Um, one of the tools that we use in the hive, of course, is the hive tool. It, well, what this does is it gives us a chance to get in between each frame and lift it up so that we can get our fingers under there and examine what's going on. Also, the favorite, the, the most favorite thing of the bee to do when we put these boxes together is to seal it and make it one unit, especially in the winter. So they'll propolize, what we call propolize with propolis, uh, and it's, it's very much like a glue. It's made from uh, tree sap and it's used to basically glue it together. So basically what we have to do when we go in each time is to pop it open so we can get in. Um, what is that tool called? A hive tool. Just a hive tool. Uh -huh. <laughs> a hive tool. The next thing we use is a smoker. And um, of course we put our fuel in here, light it with matches, and the first thing we do just to let the bees know that we're here is to smoke the entrance of the hive. Two theories on this. Not real sure which is the truth, but two theories. One is that it makes the bees think that there's a fire, which makes sense. They gorge themselves, fill their stomachs with the honey from the hive, and of course a bee with a full stomach, it's harder for them to bend to sting you. Okay. The other is that when you go in a hive, they're going to release that alarm pheromone. It's dark in there, and when you open it up to light, they're alarmed. The other theory is that this smoke will cover that alarm pheromone, and they won't be as panicked. So that is why we smoke the bees. Okay, do we have any questions so far? Everybody good? Okay, I'm going to move on to some of our hive products then. Question? Have you lost me? The, the question is related to losing hives. We had six hives last year. We lost two. Um, one probably because of the very severe winter that we had, and one because we had a laying queen, which completely destroys a hive. It's still in existence, but it's a mess. So what we're going to let it do is just, just run its natural course, and when we're done, it will be done. But that's two hives that we lost. That's an average, and it seems to be the national average because that's one-third of what we had, and the national average, when all the studies came back, they lose one-third. Most, most beekeepers lose a third of, of their hives. Um, with the lane queen, or with the lane worker, <coughs> excuse me, what happens is the hive goes queenless. It's a very rare thing for this to happen, and it's an absolute mess when it does, but the, the hive goes queenless. And instead of raising an, a queen, there's a worker that takes on that role. Of course, everything she lays is going to be unfertilized, which means that everything she lays is going to grow to be a drone. 
and over time, as the natural process goes, and, and within three, four, five weeks, the worker bees are going to come the, to the end of their life, and you're going to be basically left with a hive of drones. So it's, it's, you know, it's a problem for the beekeeper simply because if we put a new queen in, they will, they will ball and kill her um, because they sense that they have a queen, not realizing she's a lane worker. You can't get rid of that one because you don't know which one it is. Don't know which one it is. With the queen, we can determine because of looks. We have no idea which one is lane. And in a hive of 20,000, 30,000 bees, it's just not possible. We tried. Um, we tried a method that we were, we were certain would work. We took a queen right hive, moved it in the hive's place, moved the queenless hive back, and then we shook all the bees out on the ground. All the bees took to the air, flew in the queen right hive, and we thought, we've got it whipped. We've got it taken care of, um, but no such luck. When we went in and checked, they apparently killed the queen from that hive as well and she's continuing to lay drones. So we feel like rather than go through that whole process again, it's best just to leave it be, um, let it live out its natural life. Um, Could you <coughs> in, insert some royal jelly in one of the, in, in, some, in you know how they said the only way to produce a queen right. is to the royal jelly? Can that be inserted in one of the drones? You know, that Has would. That ever been done? I, I doubt that it's ever been done, but that might be something for researchers to take up, um, depending on how much royal jelly they need to be fed and when they need to be fed, and um, rather the worker bee, just to see if the worker bee would allow that to take place. But that's certainly, that's certainly something that you know, could be taken up as, as a project of research um, to see if, if that would be a solution, because as of yet, there is no solution to a laying worker hive. So, um, Okay, let's, let's go to the, some of the products of the hive. Uh, some of these you might be very familiar with. We have candles with beeswax. Um, of course, soap is made using beeswax and honey. You'll find a variety of lotions. Something new that's on the market that I really like is something called a solid lotion bar. It's actually lotion, but it's a solid bar because of the level of beeswax in it. Um, and of course an assortment of lip balm. And one thing that I don't have here would be a jar of pollen. Um, in health food stores they're starting to sell pollen. If you have allergies it really is a good idea. To, it's, it, it's the equivalent of taking an allergy shot. Um, but I, I would caution everyone if you do try that little tiny bits of pollen at a time because if you take a massive ad amount, it's probably going to hit a re an allergic reaction on that. So a little bit at a time. Um, there's a variety of honey. You can tell that uh, this came from our hives. It's a lighter honey. And one of my favorite things to do, because I'm such a bee geek, is when we go on vacation, we rec recently in Mississippi, as you go to the farmer's markets and check out the local honey. This honey is from Mississippi you can tell the difference in the color. What do they eat? I mean, what's the, what are the bees eating this? And that's, that's the key to honey, is what they, the flower source that they use. We call this flower, uh, this honey wildflower honey, basically, because we have no clue where it's coming from. Um, if it says clover, it has to be clover for a five mile radius. It has to be guaranteed that it's clover. If it's blueberry, it ha you have to be, have your bees on a field that they can get nothing but blueberry, or you can't call it blueberry. We call this wildflower because this, we actually have this next to a river, and I think they probably use marshmallow, the plant, um, tulip poplars, wild cherry, um, and a host of other things that we're probably not aware of. But they must have a good source because they really produce the honey. This is buckwheat. This is what buckwheat looks like. And when you taste it, you would swear it's molasses. The flavor is, is dramatically different. Um, blueberry honey truly does have a different flavor than what from wildflower. Buckwheat tastes completely different from wildflower. They each have their own, own variety of flavors. Um, another product that we, we like to do 
is of course to take the honeycomb and have it in a jar. Um, and again, a lot of folks like the honeycomb because what's going to be in the honeycomb? The pollen. So you take a spoonful of, of honey from the honeycomb and you're getting the enzymes, you're getting the pollen, you're getting a lot of health beneficial things. Um, Question for you. Yes. You mentioned about, you know, if you're going to claim it's clover honey, you got to have it five miles radius. Is that about what the, I was going to ask that, is that about what the average distance a worker flies? Yes. The, the question was asked in relation to how far a bee flies, between three and five miles. They won't, probably won't go past five miles um, in a, a radius. So that's why they, you know, and if it's, if it's organic honey, you have to have organic crops, three to five mile radius. Otherwise, you can't call it organic. And I believe, I believe there's also a time limit to that. I believe you have to be organic for three to five years before you can actually call it organic. Um, simply because once the pesticides get in the ground, you're going to have some residual pesticides coming up for several years. So you have to wait. Before we start extracting honey, is there any other any other questions? Any questions? I have a question. um, recently, the last couple of years, I had heard that there was a uh, an issue with bees going away and disappearing, mm -hmm. off, like literally right. gone. Right. So, what's your take on that? Colony collapse collapse disorder. Um, and it wasn't just here. I don't think no. It was like everywhere. It was everywhere. Um, the the question was asked. Uh, t for more information on colony collapse disorder, uh, which is where the bees completely disappear from the hive. They don't die. There's no, no death, no evidence of, of any disease. They're just gone. And that does indeed happen. We've never had it happen to us. We do know farmers that it's happened to. Um, lots of theories from cell phones to weather pattern changes. Um, it is getting better. They're not seeing as much of it. Uh, they thought it was possibly related to, uh, to uh, uh, trying to think of the word, not a, not a fertilizer, but a Pet and pesticide. pesticide. Thank you. <coughs> Herbicide, pesticide, neo, called neonicotinoids. I'll get it out. That's possible. <coughs> and then they found also that it was related to um, commercial beekeepers that would truck their bees from central locations up to Maine and then load them back on a truck and ship them over to California. And they thought simply the stress. Uh, it's, it's a great deal of stress. We actually moved our bees uh, because I thought it would be neat to do. And uh, we did it for one season. We won't do that again. Uh, it's, the stress on the bees is, is phenomenal. Uh, to move them. They, it takes them three days to, to become accustomed to where their new uh, environment is. Uh, they spend a great deal of time on hot trucks, uh, sealed up. They can't fly, demoralized. And they're finding now that many of the folks that had a problem with CCD was, um, were the commercial beekeepers. And they think it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's a problem with their immune systems. And, and overstressing the bees. Um, one of the things we're looking into as, as beekeepers is if you have almond groves, have your own bees. It, it's worth it. They don't have to go anywhere. It's probably more cost effective because it is a massive industry. The, the commercial beekeepers are paid very well per hive. Um, of course, they lose a lot of hives and it's very stressful on the bees. A lot of the bees were lost that way and that's, that's the current theory is that it's because of the uh, lack of immune system and commercialized bees. So, any other questions? I wanted to say a couple of words about the um, long history of beekeeping. Um, Deb shared her tradition and her family and, and also her husband's family uh, with beekeeping, but uh, this actually goes back thousands of years longer than, than people realize. Um, if you look at the cover of your packet, um, the two images that are there. The one on the left is actually a cave painting near Valencia, Spain of uh, probably a woman uh, pulling honey out of what looks like a hole in a tree with bees flying around her. 
and this, um, this cave painting is about 8,000 years old. So people have been harvesting honey from wild bees for centuries and centuries. Um, it's only been in the last, um, at some point people started to uh, keep bees in, in artificial hives that they made themselves and it, uh, that dates back at least, uh, you know, probably about 3,000 years. The, the picture on the right on your, um, on your packet is, um, those are skep hives and uh, bees and that painting is a 14th century painting. So you can see how far back this tradition has gone. And um, as Deb mentioned earlier, the method used today, the, the kind of hives we use today to keep bees in so that we don't have to destroy the hive and destroy the bees when we try to get the honey out, that uh, method is, is 18th century. So in the 1700s, um, that was uh, developed over a series, of, um, a series of developments took place, but the person who really is the father of um, American apiculture, as the fancy name for beekeeping is, is um, the man who invented the um, type of hive that we use today, Langstroth. So. If you don't have any further questions, I'm going to uh, give you a real quick demonstration of how, what it's like to extract honey. Yes? Can you uh, harvest honey in the winter? The question's been asked, can you harvest honey in the, in the winter? We don't, because in the winter what happens is, what we do, <coughs> is we go in and we condense the bees down to something that looks like this. And they cluster, similar to what they're doing, but they cluster together in the middle of the hive. To go in would break the cluster and they would more than likely freeze. So we don't go in the hive during the winter at all. Um, we, we seal them up, they seal their hive up and we hope for the best. Um, because they cluster together, the last thing you want to do is, is break that cluster. Um, it's been shown that when it is even 20 below outside, they have taken the temperature outside and then they've had a, a temperature probe inside the hive. It remains between 95 and 98 degrees in this hive constantly, even through the middle of the winter when it's 20 degrees below. So. Now, when would, it would be the last time that you would harvest your hive the, in this area? The question has been asked, when would be the last time we harvest honey in this area for this particular area? We harvest two times. We harvest in spring anything that they haven't used for the winter. We, we go ahead and take it off and give them empty frames back to fill. And then we'll harvest again in the fall. March? Oh no, that would be more like late May, April. Late April, early May. And then we'll probably take off again very lightly in uh, September. And the reason I say very lightly is we don't want to rob them to the point where they have no food for the winter. We, the, the rule of thumb is, is you leave one, one super on for them to, to nourish themselves, to eat through the... Any other questions? If you have, any, if you have ten hives? Ten hives. How much honey do you get off in the spring like, when you harvest? It really depends. Like, like any other crop, um, it, it depends on the year and the season. Um, each of these is about 50 pounds. We'll probably take two of them off through the entire season for each hive. So two times 10, 20, 20 times 50. Yeah. If, if they produce well. And again, if they don't, you know, we don't, we don't bother them. Um, any other questions? Let's show the book that you brought. You have the hive sitting on the book, but this is the book. It's, um, it's a reference book used by, uh, I would say most beekeepers are aware of this book, called The Hive and the Honey Bee. And this is uh, the book that was written uh, by the person who uh, is responsible for the design of the hive we use now. So, um, mm -hmm. so it really is a, a tome, a reference guide to uh, to beekeeping and turn it up so they can see just how thick it is. Quite a volume. There will be a quiz later on all of this material. So. What's the Langstroth. He Langstroth. is the, and it's actually in your packet. Um, there's a description of, of him uh, when he did his work and also the, the design of, that he came up with for, um, for uh, the contemporary version of, of the beehive. So um, you can refer to that too. If you need to know it, 
it's in here. <laughs> it's in here. Everything from the hobbyist to commercial beekeeping. I think on the other side, I believe on the other side, there are some books too that are a whole host of books that are coming out for children that are absolutely excellent. Do you want me to? Sure. <clears throat> some of these uh, from the very simple bees. One sentence for your little ones to a book called Busy, Busy Bees. And this is my favorite, The Honey in a Hive. Um, I look through this, and I'm fascinated by the information that's in it, and the detail and the illustrations are fabulous. Um, so if it's, if it's bees you're wanting to research, there's a whole host of, of uh, literature out there for you to pull from, as well as, as sites on the web. Now I'll switch places with Deb and let her um, conduct her demonstration of how honey is extracted. Okay. Would you mind coming up? Would you want to give me a hand with this? I, yes. I have two frames. I'll let you work on this side. This is what we use when you're small. <laughs> when you're big, you use a, a big co company and you have many frames to, uh, to undo, you use a knife a heated knife that zips right down. But when there's just a few frames, we use what's called a cap scratcher. And basically what you do, this is the frame of honey. You want to hold it up. It's, it's pretty heavy. You can really tell. Isn't it heavy? Yeah. So can you imagine nine or ten of them in a, in a hive? Um, and it's capped. Bees like to dry their honey out to about 18% humidity. And if it's capped, you know you're safe. Anything, if you uncap something and extract something that's higher than 18, you're going to have something turn into vinegar later on. It, it won't keep. Um, if it were me, that would be good, but it's not. It's, it's vinegar. So basically what you're going to do is take your, your scratcher, and you're just going to come right up under it. Don't worry about hurting the comb. You can't hurt the comb. And what you do, what you do take out, the bees will fix for you. Could I move the uh, yes. beehive over so that we could see this uh, process a little bit sure. better? I'm just going to scoot it right straight across. The very first time that I Sorry, took ladies. honey out of a frame, <laughs> I just flipped because honey was dripping down and we were wasting it and it just drove me wild that we were wasting it until we put the, the tub out where the bees were. Came back the next day, they had completely cleaned it up. It, nothing, the only thing left of the, the um, wax was just a feathery, light substance. They had taken all the honey out, so I no longer worry about that. Okay, think you got it? All right. It's just a rocking motion back. Yep, that's good. That's it. So you just simply uncap. And of course, folks that have commercial, commercial honey producing plants uh, actually have a machine that they just slide the frame right in and it, it just zips the caps right off. Okay, and this is what it looks like when the caps have been taken off. starts to ooze out and it's okay. It, it does smell good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. We do this typically on our screened porch. We call that our honey house. And when we're doing this, you would be amazed when we look up and we have bees pinging at our screens <laughs> wanting to come in. They know we have the good stuff. When you get ready, you can just flip that right over. Might be easier if you go ahead and flip that. Flip it, flip it yep. Yeah. You're doing fine. Okay. When we're finished with this, we go ahead and put it in the extractor. This has a basket in here that holds two frames. It goes from two to four to 16. 
And there are some extractors that are double decker that hold 50. Um, Oh, you're, oh no, you're fine. <laughs> you got it. You're doing well. While, they're, um, while they are extracting the honey, um, I wanted to make a quick mention of the uh, species of bees that are generally kept. Um, there are about 20,000 different species of bees, um, wild bees. Um, not all of these produce honey. Some, some types of bees produce honey um, and others don't. Uh, some species are solitary and others uh, rear their young in burrows in small colonies and then, and then they go away, um, like mason bees and bumblebees. But um, the social species of bees are the ones that uh, beekeepers are concerned with and the, um, the species of bee that is generally uh, used for beekeeping in Europe and America is called Apis mellifera. Um, and this species has several subspecies or um, regional varieties that occur in different places around the world. Um, but there is another type of bee in the tropics that's used for beekeeping um, and, or honey production, and that's called um, Apis serrana. So there's one other completely different species that is used in other parts of the world uh, for beekeeping. Um, and uh, the people who uh, r raise the bees, we were talking about the queen factories, the people who raise the bees try to get the best characteristics of these uh, subspecies and cross them so that they get um, good honey production, uh, gentle bees so that, that they're not aggressive and, and um, you know, easy to take care of. So also there's disease and parasite resistance is something they go for. The um, disadvantage to um, some of these hybrids is that in later, in the first generation of the hybrid, the children of the two that you're trying to cross, um, it has all of these good qualities. But sometimes in subsequent generations, when they Thank start so uh, crossing with each I other naturally in the hive, um, they find that uh, these advantages may fade away over several generations. And sometimes hybrids can be a little more defensive and aggressive. So there's a whole science to um, to crossing these subspecies of bees to try to get the best characteristics for people to use in their, in their beehives. Also, um, just like people, there are different races of bees. Um, we have Italian bees. Uh, they tend to be uh, yellow, very light, very small bees. Um, we have what we call carnelian bees. They're darker, more of a striped. As a matter of fact, the, the queen that you'll see in here is a carnelian bee. And we also have Russian. The new, the new type of bee is the Russian bee that, that people are trying out, and they're very, very, very dark. Um, often, once you introduce a new queen, if it's not the same race, um, you'll get a hive that's a mixed race. And, and I think you'll see that in here if you look closely. We have some Italians in there. We have some Carnelinians in there. And uh, our, our, uh, we have a few, a few Russians in there as well because they just start to mix. Depends on the drone and the... The, uh, the queen. You okay? Right, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. All right, we have our two supers and the extractor. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start slow so it doesn't break the comb and spin it around. And of course, the, the method here is centrifugal force. They're going around inside, yes. Let me, let me let you take a look at what it looks like inside. Let's see if we can do this. Okay. Okay. Right, there's a basket inside. And it's basically slinging the honey out to the sides and it'll drop down to the bottom. Now, Ooh. you have your plastic container there, but, you know, it's in the comb. What will you do with that? What you I'll, just leave it for your bees to clean it up? Or? I'll take it out, let the bees clean it up, and what's left is a nice white wax. And I make soap. I make lip balm, I make candles. Um, the, the, the way it's made is the bee, are the bees, um, is that the bees will excrete the wax from a gland in their abdomen. And when you see it, it's fascinating because it's literally little tiny sheets of wax. And they do something called chaining. Whenever you have two frames together, if you look between and you see bees hanging in the middle, they're chaining, they're pulling wax out because they get behind each other and the weight 
releases that, that sheet of wax. And um, what they basically do is chew it, form it into the cells that they need. It's, it's a laborious process. I mean, when, when you say the phrase, uh, busy as bees, you learn, you understand why. Because what everything they do is so meticulous in the hive. They're always so busy. Okay, so we're, we're, put, we're turning this way. And we would do this, we would do this for a while. And then for the sake of balance, we're going to turn it the other way. Okay. And we'll go ahead and stop with that for sake of time. When we're finished, come over and this is called the honey gate. This is called the honey gate. Okay. What we do is we extract it into a bucket that also has a honey gate when it comes time for bottling and we sieve it through. Okay. If you buy it in the store it's really been sieved very well. Nobody wants little bee legs floating around in their honey. So it's sieved very well. Um, I personally, for my own use, sieve it very little because I like the pollen. I like the pollen. I like a little bit of wax um, in my honey. I don't mind. So what we do is when we're finished extracting and this gets fuller, we open the honey gate and we go ahead and let the honey. Yes. No, by the time they get to this process, they're probably already gone. Yeah, that's yes, the, the, okay. 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 And what we'll do is we'll let it, we'll let it sieve out. Okay. And when it comes down in here and this bucket fills out, we'll tap it into jars. All right? We're down to our last few minutes of our, of our uh, time. Are there any uh, questions uh, as we wrap it up? Yeah. Yes? Um, do you have to work with sterilized equipment, or do you just wash it around and wash it? The question is asked is, do we need to have sterilized equipment for our honey? Yes. Yes, especially if we're going to sell it. Um, it needs to be sterilized, but right now, there are no, no guidelines. The FDA has no guidelines for honey. Um, so when you're in, in the store and if you purchase honey, number one, purchase it from a local beekeeper. But if you can't, check the label carefully because they do have to tell you what it is. And often you'll see honey and corn syrup. So be, you know, let the buyer beware. They mix it. The corn syrup is much cheaper than than honey, they mix it. I think um, we have time for one last question. All right, yeah. Is there a queen in there? There is a queen in there. So look for, and the best way to locate her is to look for her circle of, of caretakers. Look for, look for a group of bees that are moving across the frame in a circle because she always has that circle with her taking care of her. At and the do very they end. Stay in there all the time, or do you move this out? Oh, we. Do they go out with boots? No, I. They are actually from my hive, and when we get home, we'll put them right back in their hive. This is one of this piece that's down in here is a frame like this, so she can just take this frame and put it right back in the yeah. in the hive. And that water at the top. Is sugar water, sugar water. Mm -hmm. Yes. What personality do your bees have? The question was asked: What personality do my bees have? Um, it depends on the hive, and I'm glad you asked that because I have to tell you, some of them are very, very gentle. There's not a problem at all. Some of them are as mean as dirt. <laughs> um, we got into a hive the other day, and, and literally as we reached in to take the frames out, they were jumping at us to sting us. They got me. Um, but to tell you the truth, the gentle hives are wonderful, but those hives that are mean produce the most honey. We like to see the meat. Yes, they, yeah. 
Um, I want to thank everybody for coming, and um, I want to thank Deb for being here with us today and sharing her expertise. It's been uh, something different for us and something fun for us, so uh, thank you, Deb. My pleasure.